r slash no sleep. Posted by you slash pappy. Strange. Life. I stopped a hooded man from killing a college girl as she ran along a trail. I really wish I hadn't. The old platitude says if you set out on a path of revenge, best dig two graves. Let me tell you, if you set out to be a hero, dig a fucking graveyard. I'd long since given up on being a meaningful part of this world. A lucrative career was traded in for the joys of freedom and isolation. Friendships and potential connections abandoned by the wayside to avoid the continual pain and disappointment. The realization that there really isn't much purpose, and that's okay. I'd gone from a three-piece suit and a view of downtown to making money in between the lines. Selling edibles. Homemade beef jerky. Endless weeks of all-night poker sessions. Small scams. Petty theft. Whatever hustle was lucrative then and there. It was a Friday night, and I was doing doing gig food delivery on one of the apps. It only paid if you really understood the system. I could make it work just enough to make it worth it, and the dozen holes in their business model provided an endless opportunity to scam food. Yes, I am, was, that guy. I know, fuck me. I certainly didn't care about others, not really. I wasn't hatefully stewing a la taxi driver, just completely disconnected. Indifferent. But I suppose there was some old part of me, some light that still lingered. And that part probably damned so many. I was cruising along the medical center by the extremely prominent university I graduated from, once upon a time. The campus was encircled by a massive gravel public track, situated near one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city. A place for the intelligentsia and the trophy wives of oil millionaires to endlessly burn lactic acid in the rugged pursuit of, something. Greed. Purpose. Who knows. It was about 1 am I was just cruising past where the trail kinked north when I saw it. When we watch films, little faces us. An explosion of gory violence. A demonic jump scare. James Wood's face. These horrifying images are pretty normative, so our central nervous system stays pretty well in flow. But in real life, when you see something profoundly horrific, the CPU starts crashing as it tries to reconcile the black swan event with how reality is supposed to go. I remember, somewhere subconsciously, wondering if that hesitation was going to cost this poor college girl her life. Only part of her was visible to me, but she had backed up against one of the magnificent oaks that lined the paths. A man twice her size, adorned in a black hoodie, black jeans, and white gloves was barreling toward her with a knife in his hand. She didn't move. I guess I thought at the time she was paralyzed with fear. It happens, right? My shitty Toyota jumped the curb, and I was out the door without even putting it in park, sprinting with everything I had. Fifteen years of baseball and four years of rugby had taught me how to explode and cover a short distance quickly. But that was a far away time and a long gone place. I was run down and ragged these days. Apparently I still had a step in me. The incidental benefit of adrenaline is it doesn't leave lot of room for second guessing. Instinct snaps up the controls. We'd probably all be better if that were the case most of the time. Not much thought went into spearing him right in the side and slamming him onto the gravel path. I could hear what I thought was sobbing behind me. It felt like blood was pulsating in my ears, denying me my hearing. The whole world sounded like if Charlie Brown's parents had done a few whippets. His screams were inaudible wah-wahs. The attacker certainly had size on me. But I'd spent a good chunk of my life getting into fistfights. Even won a few, too. Heaven hates an Irish temper. The element of surprise and my ruthlessness really saved the day. He tried to use his superior size to flip me over as my knees dug into his chest. I drove down, using my stocky frame and low center of gravity to hold tight, and slammed a fist into his exposed neck. I ignored his gasps and flailing. A punch to the nose. Now the eyes. Spasming like a salted slug, he finally managed to fling me off him. He was off like a rocket, tearing into the night. Tough piece of shit, I remember thinking. My gut said chase him down. The hunter following the blood and tracks of a deer leaking from a body shot. But when I looked back and saw her, I knew I couldn't. She looked, off. There was fear, so much fear, but it felt like a mask. Sobs that felt like a recording. Professions of, thanks that seemed overly enthused. A pantomime. She flung her arms around me. I called the police. They came and took her statement. Sally Rigby was her name. A senior, doubling majoring in computer science and Chinese language. Sally Rigby was the future, and I, a shell of a person, a glorified worm, an unplugged toaster, had saved her. We told the police everything we knew. He was black, and given Sally's adorably white disposition, meant the police would actually pursue this with vigor. 
They found his knife in a bush a few feet from where we tussled. I didn't get a great look, but it appeared weirdly ornate. Like a dagger in a cornball movie trying to convince the audience the weapon is ancient and ambiguously ethnic. Sally never left my side. Beaming up at me. Holding my arm. Thanking me in that weird Stepford Wives meets Tom Cruise's empty eyes sort of way for saving her from inevitable rape and death. The police took our information, and Sally asked for my number before they took her to get checked out at the hospital. I figured that was the end of it, unless they caught the creep, and I had to testify. Apparently, four girls had gone missing on campus in the last two months. The always loathsome police slapped me hard on the back, saying I might have just beaten down a serial killer. They dug under my nails for DNA. I wish that had been the end of it. God. Be grateful for all the things you don't know. The next day Sally began texting me. She oscillated between discussing her trauma and endlessly thanking me. I felt obliged to muster real responses. She had suffered something truly horrible. I might not have a kernel of faith in humanity, but I wasn't a monster. I wasn't. By the second day, the texts are turned flirtatious. Compliments I would never expect. Questions about my life, my past, my hobbies, my beliefs. I called her. I was worried one of two things was happening, either she felt she owed me something, to make me feel good, or she was becoming attached to me as a sort of trauma response. Neither was a good path, so I wanted to nip it in the bud as gently as possible. This had nothing to do with delusional narcissism on my part. I took this line of thinking, dear reader, in large part because, well, in no possible other scenario would Sally be interested in me. And who could possibly blame her? She was 23, more than 10 years my junior. Blonde, fit, brilliant, witty, gorgeous, vivacious. I was a broke down car that somebody threw a shitty paint job on. Nihilism, whiskey, and a degenerate lifestyle do not a pretty visage make and surly to boot. The plan derailed quickly. Sally insisted we go out, that night. A vibrant restaurant and bar I sometimes picked up orders at. A sea of humans bolstering plastic smiles with the false hope only ethanol can provide. Every time I tried to break through to explain, she talked over me with greater exuberance. Finally, I snapped. Sally. I'm like, 40 pounds overweight, run down, not particularly pleasant, way too old for you. You don't owe me anything. You do the right thing because it's the right thing. I don't want someone to go out with me out of obligation. There was a long pause. It felt angry, pregnant with rage. I genuinely like you, Pappy. I'll spare you the masturbatory recounting, but she heaped an avalanche of compliments, putting up a fierce argument oozing with sweetness. I gave in and met her two hours later. I never imagined the date from hell being taken in the literal sense. We never even made it inside. While we waited for a table, our conversation took one wild turn after another. So many common interests and hobbies. Similar perspectives, though hers a significantly softer version. An uncomfortable amount of similarities coming out of left field. That should have been a red flag, but the Venus flight wrap doesn't go hunting, now, does it? Happy the fly, they call me. A few whiskey sours while we waited and pretty soon, we were slammed up against a wall in the alley. While I was kissing her neck and running my hand slowly up her leg, she whispered in my ear. I expected a sensual moan, maybe a little dirty talk. Nope. Nope. I jumped about four feet back. What she said didn't make much sense then, but it was her voice. Imagine the screech of an angry goat mixed with the hoarse gasp of lifelong smoker battling emphysema. Now throw in the squeal of a slaughtered pig and a demonic baritone that would have bested Johnny Cash. That is what I heard in my ear, and that is why I jumped back. They're here. And I want you to watch what you wrought, you empty thing. I stared at her as she transformed. It wasn't like the movies. Bones didn't stretch and squeal. Skin didn't inflate and shift. It didn't have the feel of slow animation. One minute a solid ten in a slinky black dress was there, and the next, hell's special little abortion stood in her stead. My first thought was, I just made out with a fucking gorilla. And that I'd be the first person to say that in retrospect literally. A seven-foot ape completely covered in crisscrossing black and white hair glared me down. But this wasn't George of the Jungle. This was an acid trip gone horribly awry. Four eyes, each a different color. Red, sapphire blue, a deep purple, yellow, in a perfect line across the forehead. An impossibly large mouth with a single tooth descending nearly six inches out of the creature's mouth clicked against its twin that shot up from its lower gums. A single horizontal slit for a nose, and with every fresh breath, black smoke came pouring from it. Where ambidextrous paws should be were massive, humanoid hands, almost comically large. 
the creature rested on the outer palm of each one. Protruding out were at least 25 fingers, each ending with a bone jutting out, sharpened to an infinitely fine shank tip. I just stood and stared. You can't outrun that tsunami. You can just sit back and enjoy the last moments in the sun. They came in screaming, each clutching the same odd knife. A sea of men in black hoodies, black pants, and white gloves. Every swing was batted away as the creature moved with impossible dexterity. It ripped a man's head off and ate it with a single crunch. A swipe of one hand disemboweled another. Two hands smashed a chest, turned the man's body gelatinous. One by one, the small army was eviscerated in ever-escalating displays of grotesque violence. I was frozen. The, thing began what I suppose was a laugh midway through the maelstrom. With that voice that felt like a kidney stone zigzagging through my body echoing, you did this you did this you did this gleefully as it turned burly men into viscera with ease. No knife came even close to striking what was Sally, and the ground was littered with them, along with every organ imaginable. I picked a dagger up. Not to test my abilities against whatever the fuck this nightmare was but to just cut my throat. I felt a hand, strong but human, stop me and pull me away, and we were running, the sounds of ghoulish laughter and human skin being ripped off not far behind us. After what felt like miles, we hid in an alley. The man took off his hoodie and I finally got a glimpse of him. It was the attacker, the one I stopped. His eyes looked badly damaged, his nose was still askew. I had done a number on him. It dawned on me then that might have only been because he didn't want to hurt me. What have I done? My whisper held more emotion than I'd expressed in the better part of a year. You couldn't know. His accent was African, though in my ignorance, I could not place it. What, what the fuck is she? The man steeled his gaze. That is no she. That is not even in it. We have a word for them, but there's no real translation to English. The closest thing is decayed whore. D, decayed whore? Before white men, before Christ, there was a small village in what is today Uganda. What the villagers thought was simply a man, a traveler, passed through the village. When he asked for water, he was given water. When he asked for food, he was given food. When he asked for souls, the villagers chased him far off, into the night. All he did is laugh as he ran. Then came the decay. The rains never came. Crops withered away and died. Any trace of game to hunt disappeared entirely. Sickness never seen before stole the life from children. Every night, booming laughter could be heard echoing in the sky. The minds of the villagers began to twist and knot. Finally, the man who was not a man passed back through when the remaining villagers were summoning their strength to try and migrate somewhere where life persisted, where hope still lay. He said would never let them leave. But they had a choice. Die horrible deaths or give him the souls he asked for. Many villagers, women and children among them, died trying to kill him. This man that was not a man. This wandering demon of the ancient world. Those who refused him, he let live to rot away. They and the others died heroes. Eleven villagers did not. They agreed. Gave up. Surrendered their souls. He chained their bodies together, dragged them into the mountains. No one knows what he did with them. But by the time he finished his dark works, they had turned into monsters. The demon added insult to injury, bastardizing the sacred, peaceful form of the gorilla into something only pure evil could imagine, let alone rot. Those amongst us that hunt the eleven are the descendants of those who found the villagers who lived before they died horrible, agonizing, and slow deaths. When our ancestors went to dig graves for these poor souls, they found buried in each hole the same dagger. Put there by some spirit of the earth or heavens, we assume. A chance to rid the world of what should never have been. It's our duty to destroy these abominations. We have hunted them for thousands of years. We've learned subtle clues that help us track them. I am called Adroa. You, I believe, are Pappy. Tears streamed down my eyes. Can't we, can't we find her when she turns back into Sally? Kill her then? Adroa sighed wearily. There is no Sally. The decayed whores can take on the form of anyone. It changed into that form just to mock me as I missed swipe and after swipe. It was just playing with its food. I thought I had surprised it, just this once, in time to kill it. The real problem is, they like to take up roost. Unadulterated violence and stark terror have become boring to them. They like to establish a hunting ground, pick through a population, drive up panic. It's a game to them. Subtlety that creates fear they can smell, laugh about, marinate in. Then they corner their prey and quench their bloodlust. But it will eat up all the organs and lick up all the blood of tonight and tomorrow, it will move out of its form and walk among those students, playing its sick game.
More will go missing. Ripped apart. Eaten. Adroa looked completely defeated, but a single glance in his eyes told me he'd never give up. He'd die upon his sword. Or, dagger, as it may be. Adroa. You said there were eleven decayed whores in the beginning that came down from the mountains. How, how many have your people killed? His head dropped in his hands, a dagger listlessly hanging at his side. Posted by you slash pappy. Strange, life. I live in a town in Texas that doesn't exist. We have a disturbing annual ritual, and this year, it was my turn. Eat your meat, son. It was delicious, as always. Thick, hearty, bloody, cooked and seasoned to perfection. A whole plate, all from the same steer. Each family received one full cow, butchered up and packaged perfectly. Even the wafting smell of the aromatic steak, nearly cartoon-like as it drew us all in, could not lift the dour mood that hung over the table. My father always grumbled. Never yelled, never whispered, never quipped, just grumbled. Like the world was a pointless chore he just kept putting off. I wish that explained why we lived inside Texas. It didn't. There are well over 1,000 small towns here in the Lone Star State. All of them make the cut to get on the map, cut and shoot, Luckenbach, you name it. Bumfuck nowhere, meet cartography, you're one suitor. But not Scythe. You could pick up a dusty roadside map from 1975 absentmindedly stored in an attic box, no Scythe. You can scour the internet for us today. Google has never heard of us. By extension, neither has God. I wish I could say this cold, lost part of the world was home because my father wanted no peace of life. The reality is, we'd simply lived there for generations. Everyone's family had. Nobody ever left, or came, to Scythe. Not permanently. Those who went to get provisions or services found themselves racing back to our little hamlet. Everything we needed to build, we learned. It had been that way for generations. A lonely, little self-sufficient blot. In retrospect, life was mostly typical, albeit mind-numbingly dull. My childhood diverged in two profound aspects. Well, three. Three. First, a class in school we had to take annually from kindergarten through our senior year of high school. A class called Obedience. Like any other class, over 13 years it developed from rudimentary facts and building blocks to the abstract and theoretical, more esoteric concepts. It was a strange hodgepodge of history, sociology, divinity, and law, all centered around our town. And the rules. My God, the endless rules. I'll spare you the infinite laundry list but suffice it to say, two themes dominated every lesson, no one could ever come to or leave Scythe, and we could never communicate with the outside world. The penalties, all doled out publicly, ranged from obscene humiliation to gruesomely creative torture, but the driving point was always the same, if you don't obey, you will suffer. I had the same thought anyone have in this situation. The thought we all had. The thought we whispered when we thought no one was in earshot. Just book it. Head for them thar hills. We learned quickly that was not an option. One of the earliest edicts decreed that if anyone escaped, their punishment would pass on, with increased magnitude. Vague language. We knew from obedience that the principle was interpreted liberally. Your friends. Your family. Your neighbors. The guy you had a three-minute conversation with every second Wednesday at the feed store. All on the chopping block. Brutalized. Tortured. The last person to leave Scythe was in 1916. Herbert Figus. A 16-year-old who made it out. After all, it isn't hard. There were no guards to dodge or walls to scale. If you wanted to, you could just leave. Nobody is sure why Herbert left. Maybe he didn't believe what they'd do, hadn't seen what we'd seen. Maybe he had, and he just didn't care. But the statute was absolute, and its enforcement drove a message that kept us existentially and literally locked in place. After all, each family took turns polishing the sun-bleached skulls of Herbert's mother, father, and two toddler-aged sisters that rest on jutted stakes on the road leading out of town. One skull reads obey. Another, punish. The skulls of the two little girls were marred with a single, fading word, culling. Nobody sees clear when they're standing in a storm. Sure, in retrospect, it all seems obviously insane and evil, but this is what we knew from our first memories, all we knew. We had no yardstick to compare it to. By the time we were old enough to see the horrifying parallels between us and the rest of the world a la the internet and social media, we knew the cost. We'd seen it with our eyes. The punishment. The torture. We kept our secrets with absolute obedience. Reprimands were rare. 
There is no doubt draconian rule is a moral aberration. But you also can't doubt its efficacy. It usually only happened every few years. Dan, the young hardware store owner with his stiff limp and kind eyes, lost two fingers for writing a letter. Not an expose, nothing scandalous. He'd been a fan of a band, Modest Mice or House or something like that. How he'd gotten the letter out, or how he had been discovered, we never learned. The only clarity for us was the aftermath. Two fingers for a fan letter with no return address. Taken slowly by a dulled, serrated knife. We all had to watch. And listen. I'd never heard a grown man scream and sob for his mother before. Never heard a knife try to scrape its way slowly through dense bone, like trying to fell a tree with a weak saw. Like I said, effective. The second was the culling. A mandatory annual trial. We'd studied the ritual extensively in school. Think decathlon meets quiz bowl. A series of physical and intellectual challenges designed to gauge the best amongst us. And weed out the worst. Okay, so, decathlon and quiz bowl, with just a hint of most dangerous game. We didn't know that those who ranked in the bottom half were killed. We were taught in obedience they were simply aided the town. That was the only word they'd ever use. Aided. We did know that the bottom half of scorers were never seen or heard from again. We all assumed best case was expulsion, which seemed like it might just be a godsend, or worse, death. There were always rumors. The losers were sacrificed to some hidden pagan god. The town council was secretly cannibals, and this was how they got their fix. Speculation, I figured, wouldn't change the color of the sky, the smell of mesquite on the wind, or my fate. I just let it all go, you can't stop what's coming. I'd watched family after family maintain their composure as their son or daughter didn't return from the woods where the games were held. There were no tears of anguish, no maudlin breakdowns, no mawkish gestures. Just rigid acceptance. Just obedience. I remember that year vividly. The bitter cold was punctuated by the endless wind that held across the flat, barren deserts and the endless acres of yellow grass, chasing its way through the mesas. It was my year. I was a senior, ready to graduate. All of us would meet at the edge of the woods just before the witching hour. I missed Matt. My best friend, a year ahead of me in school. He'd been beside me all my life. We were inseparable. More like brothers, really. I never knew a kinder, more genuine soul. He'd been beloved. After the culling last year, Matt never came home. Any rage or despair was quelched by years of indoctrination and traumatic memories. Life moved forward, the continual condition. We knew the games were treacherous, full of arcane riddles and intense physical challenges. We'd prepared how we could. Study obedience, perfect your body, sharpen your mind. The wind seemed to change direction, making a roundabout, and coming from behind me, trading the stinging of my cheek for a shove toward the woods. I remember my father shoving three pieces of freshly seared steak in my backpack, looking me squarely in the eyes, the faint reek of gin on his breath. You, you eat these, pappy. You eat them, keep you warm, keep you strong when the time comes. You, you gotta understand there are reasons, is a reason, well I can't say but this is how it is and there ain't no choice and just eat this and try to understand, we must. Eat your meat, son. I remember glancing back and seeing my father down the meager remnants of the bottle in a single swig, looking at me, and crying like he'd never see me again. That was as close to an I love you as I was gonna get in this world. In this strange little town. I remember seeing families sending their teenagers off with grandiosity and glee, like they knew they'd be back. My mother never left her bed. Wouldn't even open her eyes to say goodbye. The bell tolls for Pappy, apparently. I was fairly confounded by the whole thing. Making bets on the outcome was strictly prohibited, but if it wasn't, I'd be an odds-on favorite to easily make the top half. Academically, I had crushed my way into the top 5%. I was an athlete, adept at nearly every sport I played. Fast. Strong. Quick on my feet. And I didn't waver under pressure. So why the funeral knell from my folks? My thought was interrupted as the wind moaned against my back and forced me into the tree line. I saw everyone. Every kid in my grade. A thousand stories, a million memories. And time for half of us to exit stage left to wherever that might lead. Eat your meat. A man none of us had noticed had slithered out of the forest. His voice was hardly a whisper but was unshakably commanding. He bore the crest of our village on his shirt. A cow hanging upside above a gathering of people, blood covering their faces as they looked upward. Only one person inside could wear the crest the shepherd. We all knelt in reverence before eating our respective steaks. 
obedience had taught us the shepherd was a venerable position. He alone tended to the massive herd, slaughtered them by hand, packaged their legs and chests and rumps. He was the giver of life in a dry, dead place, and he was to be honored. He also was sequestered from the village, his name permanently abandoned, vows of celibacy and secret religious oaths. For he, and he alone, oversaw the culling. The shepherd gave us time to eat, his grayish-blue eyes piercing us one by one, as though deciding our fate. It is time. Less of an observation, and more of a command. He seemed somehow both strong and lifeless, like grass that just refused to die out. We all rose to our feet and began following him. Every few strides he'd turn his head, careening it side to side. Monitoring his flock, making sure we were all in tow. Each of us was bursting with nervous energy. It was palpable in the air. But it had long been ingrained in us that this was our deepest religious right, and idle chatter amounted to punishable sacrilege. And I was a fan of my fingers. We all kept searching, peering into the abyss, trying to discern some sort of obstacle course or battleground. There were just woods, growing ever thicker, the trees climbing ever higher. The well-worn path, plainly walked by thousands, led the way. We marched through a thick, wintry forest in a part of the world where there are no trees. This was a place of holy dread. The path led us to a steep hill. Almost like a tiny mountain concealed within the deepest trees. There were no mountains here. There weren't hills here. The earth was flat and dry and barren. Here, I leave you. Go up. We looked at each other and one by one, we began to trudge up the incline. As we passed, the shepherd muttered something indecipherable to each of us. I swear I heard, eat your meat. We finally arrived at the top of this oversized hill. Nearly 70 of us, all shivering, inched forward in the pitch black. The world was suddenly on fire and my eyes only saw a blistering white. Screams of terror and panic arose everywhere around me as we began slamming into one another. No amount of programming can override the autonomic. Quiet. We all fell silent. Still. We all stood fast in place. Behold. My vision returned, adjusting to the light the flickering flames cast around us. I consider myself moderately brave. There is no doubt in my mind I would have shrieked like a banshee and dove rolling off that hill if I had the slightest choice in the matter. My legs would not move at my command, nor would my voice cry out. We all glanced around, eyes bulging, realizing we were all frozen in place, entrenched by some spell. Thousands of human skulls ringed the hilltop. Maybe tens of thousands. They were piled high, a circular wall of art deco death that never seemed to move. A bright and devilish fire danced atop the skulls, never touching them. Weaving its way between us were three demons. Silly. Foolish. Children. Each spoke a word as it slithered between us. Not like you and I speak. There was no tenor, no fullness. Each whisper sounded like wind being forced by some weak instrument. A quiet, long, and laborious exhalation. In my deepest nightmares, I could not have conceived these three. Their bodies were as pale as the moonlight that ran from them, sinewy, curving torsos ending in a tadpole tail. Nine arms sprouted from each torso, and on nine hands were nine fingers. Their faces were each held a toothless, lipless mouth that protruded too far and looked as though it had been torn away by time and force, like the withering of a canyon across millennia. Each creature had two vertical slits for a nose and no eyes. Their skull was an elongated, fleshy, translucent helmet that extended backwards by two feet. Two massive horns sprouted forward, each twisting and turning, kinking to a sharpened end nearly 15 feet above their respective heads. And they were dripping. Their eyes, their mouths, every last one of their fingers. A horrible rain that spilled all over us as they weaved between us. Blood. We were covered in their dripping blood. It smeared our faces as they floated by, rained down on us as they swirled above us. Not. Ghosts. Not. Ghouls. Not. Demons. They took turns, each pushing out a breathless whisper. Each word sent electricity down my spine. My eyes caught a few of my classmates wetting themselves. Who could blame them? Each of the monstrosities breathed deep, sucking in the smell of us. Meat. The dove in, up and down, eyeless, smelling our transfixed bodies, coating us in more and more blood. Shepherd. We all felt our bodies turn, pulled by some force beyond our control and understanding. The shepherd stood before us, his beautiful eyes were filled with sorrow. And duty. I shall make this as quick as possible. Our people tried to traverse this land nearly 300 years ago. 
each family's founding father and mother. But here in this dead wasteland, they fell victim. The weather trapped them for a night. But the next morning, there was disease. A plague, a pestilence. For we had sullied a holy land with our unwelcomed presence. There was no game to hunt. The livestock they brought with them for their journey did not last long. The earth was too hard and empty to grow crops. And the disease grew ever worse. The pilgrims began to bleed. From their eyes. Ears. Mouths. Everywhere. Everywhere was blood, and hunger. They were too weak by the end to even turn to cannibalism. Then, out of the doom of the dark, came the Boventus. Three gods who claimed this land for their own millions of years before breath entered the first mammal's lungs. We know little of their story. Their true name, we do not know. We ask little out of reverence. We only adhere to the deal we struck. Obedience. They graciously cured the party of the horrible disease and offered them food. In exchange for a deal, half of the party would be given over to them. Fed to them. It was to be their choosing who would be sacrificed. Each person chosen was consumed whole. Half of our people, gone. The disease was cured, but the hunger remained. Until our masters vomited up the skeleton of each sacrifice, one, by one, by one. And shrieked into the wind. Out of the torso of each skeleton burst a single cow. Full, fat, docile. The shepherd dropped to his knees, eyes raised to the heavens, leaving pretense behind. We ate. Oh, how we ate. I can still taste them. I cannot tell you why, but my father tasted the best. Our new gods ordered us to stay, shrouding this corner of the world off from prying eyes who might find us. But we were bound to police our own people from leaving, from revealing our existence. We were to bear certain burdens for our sins. Every year we were to bring them a fresh batch of adults. Every year they would consume half. And every year, they would give us back an equal number of cattle born from each corpse. The shepherd looked tired. I was there. There that day. I can still feel the hunger, the disease, the pain and panic. We were given a pious offer, one which had to be accepted. Fear rose in his eyes. It was plainly clear then, as it is now, the Boventus do not choose the weakest, the cruelest, the slowest amongst us. As immortal penance, they choose the best among us to be eaten. I, I was made the shepherd. Burdened with the duty to forever tend the cattle, forever see to the culling. They, they burrowed inside my mind. The saw who I was. What I was. The worst of all of us. They saw the little native boy I raped after slaughtering his family when I was out hunting. The good and true and brave and strong, they ate. But we remnants were blessed with the truest gift. For the first time, the shepherd's voice rose, reaching a frenetic crescendo. Do you know that other people must eat plants, fruits, so many foods? They must drink water, or they will die. Imagine. The meat of cattle forever sustains our body. They took away that weakness. The gifts wrought from the culling forever keep us fed, strong, and healthy. Such was our deal. We have long concocted a lie to keep this ritual in place. Deviation, disobedience, will lead to a fate far worse than starvation or incurable blight. Those of you who fear you are weak, wrong, or unworthy, take solace. To those of you who are strong, decent, and true, I am sorry. You will aid us. This, I learned that day, was the third way my life profoundly diverges from your own. I only need the muscle, fat, and flesh of cow to survive. I am unencumbered by thirst, free from a prison of nutrition. I have never tasted fruit, eaten a vegetable, or had anything to drink. I just crave beef. The Bovendus began encircling us, their lidless faces and withered mouths spilling whispers as they cascaded up and down, smelling us. I thought of Matt. Kind, gentle, honest, and true. And gone. I felt them inside my brain. I watched as each of these ancient gods began to swallow my classmates whole, as though they were nothing more than a morsel. Whispers echoed in my mind. You. Are. Unworthy. Liar. Murderer. We. See. Visions of it all slammed against my psyche. A young boy, Manny, had taken to taunting me on midnight runs from his bike. One night I whipped a rock at him. I didn't even think I'd even hit close to him. But it had smashed into his head, crushing his little temple. I had buried him along the path. He was never found. There was an investigation, but nothing turned up. All they knew was Danny had not left. We. Told. Them. Murdered. We. See. All. No. 
Punishment. For. You. But. Living. Suddenly, I could move again. Everything ached. Around me, quiet sobs, terrified knees hitting the ground. The world in slow motion. Culling. Those of us less worthy, the rotten apple in each bunch tossed together, shook with terror. You. Will. Watch. For hours, we watched in sheer terror as the bovintus vomited up each skeleton. Eventually, a steer or heifer erupted from every chest cavity. For my part, I just sobbed. The shepherd led us back down the path, corralling us and the cattle that were once our friends. Looking back, I saw the bovintus go about their dark work, stacking more skulls upon the pile. My father looked equally shocked and disgusted to see me. How, how are you, how are you alive? What did you do? All pride was gone. He'd thought me good and sent me on my merry way to my doom. Any joy in his I was robbed by fury. What did you do, dad? What did mom do? Huh? I sat at the table. A neat, freshly seared stack of steaks beckoned to me. My mother came downstairs, her eyes never leaving the floor. My father speared a steak and plopped one onto each of our plates. So now you know. I am posting this story, dear reader, giving into the temptation of the internet, because someone should know. The world should know. The bovindus will. I'm sure I'll lose a hand, a foot, some fingers. Maybe they'll pluck out an eye. Maybe worse. But that comes later. For now, meat. So now you know, son. My father breathed the sigh of a broken man, a wordless whisper escaping his lips. So, who is this? I pointed to the beautifully cooked remnants of our cow. There was accusatory venom in my voice, but I knew I was no better. My father looked me square in the eye and said something I cannot shake. Eat your mat. Posted by you slash pappy. Strange. Life. No. Family traditions. Some families watch home alone around Christmas. Others coordinate outfits for Halloween. The men in my family commit suicide just before their 34th birthday. I discovered my father's body when I was just 9 years old. School had let out early, and instead of being treated to an afternoon of cartoons, I got viscera. A handgun to the head. A note that simply read no. A skull that simply wasn't there anymore. A birthday cake, happy 34th Papa Bear etched in bright red icing, covered in grey brain matter. We hadn't seen him in a week. My sister Daisy found my oldest brother Conrad's body swinging from a tree in the backyard. She never really recovered. She chased the dragon to forget, and just before she'd nod off, she would mumble about the swaying and creaking of the tree being a song of warning. She'd found a note tucked in his shoe that simply read no. Decorations adorned the backyard, green and purple lettering glittering excitedly in the sun, happy 34th, wishing his corpse well. No one had seen him in a week. Happy college graduation to me. Elvin, three years my senior, took off after that. None of us ever saw or heard from him again. We all agreed, in tacit silence, he had taken his own life and just saw fit to spare us the inevitable pain of finding the body. My mother never spoke about any of it. If you pressed her hard enough, she'd mumble about a sickness running through my dad's family. We all knew our grandfather had committed suicide before we were born and that dad was an only child. When you asked her, she never sounded angry, maybe a bit sorrowful, but not bereaved. It was always vexing but I never made any headway. With each passing day she retreated further and further within herself, reticent to talk or do much of anything. Life moves on, whether you want it to or not. Daisy disappeared into Alice's terrible rabbit hole and the last any of us heard of her, she was still somewhere, scraping the bottom of it and dancing with the golden brown. My mom left and moved to Florida because that seems to be the perfunctory thing to do when you give up but have a decent bank account. I coped. I honestly couldn't tell you how. Coldness? Indifference? A wall built up inside, maybe. I moved across the country and threw myself into law school, eventually becoming a trial attorney. The work was serendipitous, really. It was a sickness of its own that consumed everything. It suited my perfectly. There was not time to think, feel, or decay. No room to make a family or build a life, there was just non-stop, dramatic bombardment. Time moved impossibly fast and my mind was too crowded for thoughts of the past. That was fine with me. You'd think I'd be racked with anticipation and anxiety as my 34th birthday loomed. I didn't care. I didn't think about my family and when I did, I only caustically surmised they all made choices. They had choices, they made them, the end. No one forced my grandfather, father, or brother take their own lives. 
My sister stuck those needles into her veins of her own accord. Alvin made his choice to just run for the hills. And my mom's foray into self-imposed solitude and exile was of her own making. I had no compassion for them. To me, each of their choices just compounded the sorrow of those left behind who in turn made even more horrible and selfish choices. The coldness grew inside me like a virus, and I didn't care. I never told anyone in my new life about my family. Not that there was really anyone in my life. Just visitors kept at arm's length, distractions to pass the time, marks on the life or prisoner's wall. If anyone asked about my family, I just said vaguely said we never got along and weren't in contact. I honestly didn't even realize my 34th was a week away. I'd made junior partner two years ago and I had Machiavellian designs on having my name on the firm's letterhead. It wasn't until Janice, our firm's ancient legal secretary who seemed to predate the law itself, asked me what kind of cake I wanted. You'd think it would have sunk in then, but I shrugged it off. I had one chemical company to sue and another to defend. I didn't have time for mental illness. Seven days before my birthday, I woke up in a daze, naked from the waist down, my white undershirt stained bright red, having devoured two pounds of raw beef. It was unsettling but I was more concerned with spending the remainder of the night and maybe the next few days sick. I had trial prep, conferences, motions to edit, law clerks to scream at. I never got sick. Six days before my birthday, I came to, stark naked in a field. The skeleton of a goat, still wet here and there with the remnants of innards, lay beside me. I could still taste it. I'd even chewed off some of its horns. Five days before my birthday, I saw it for the first time. The creature. The thing that shouldn't be but was. It was scaling the exterior wall of our firm's building. I was completely convinced I was hallucinating, a side effect from sleep deficiency and my ludicrous new involuntary diet. It couldn't be real. The, thing, was six feet long, at least, but didn't look like it was supposed to be. Its body appeared as if machines had taken a human and unwillingly stretched it. The torso was simply too long compared to the rest of the body. Its flesh was a nauseating combination of splotched tan and red, what I imagined a human might look like if you just ever so carefully shaved off the top layer of skin. What little flesh I could make out. There was nothing but a skull in place of a head, but the eye holes were empty and distended to form enormous vertical slits. At the end of its legs, nothing but bones protruded, shaped into horrifyingly extended claws. Somehow, none of that was nearly as disturbing as what stuck out of it. Every sharp implement conceivable protruded from its body. A dozen scissors protruded here and there. Hedge clippers swayed to and fro on the back of its neck. What looked like a broken spear jutted out of its left side. Innumerable knives covered half of its torso. A dozen more weapons I couldn't even really make out were stabbed so deeply into the thing, they were a part of it. As it moved, they moved. The thing was scaling the outside of sheer rock wall and glass windows with ease, powering along absurd grace and unfathomable speed. I don't know how bone could cling to glass or rock, but it did. The monstrosity kept tilting its head up, seeming to sniff with a nose that wasn't there, climbing higher and higher before coming to a dead stop outside a window. I could only sit, dumbfounded, staring at something that defied every ounce of the logic that saved me from the perils of the past. But I was certain it was outside my office window. With a snap, its head turned, and it saw me with eyes that weren't. That just, weren't. It leapt 34 stories off the side of the building and cleared about half a football field toward me before I could blink, like a deer springing through the morning forest, unperturbed. A guttural, high-pitched screech came out of it as it bounded toward me, sounding precisely like what I imagine a pig dying sounds like, desperate, panicky, a death squeal. It was moving toward me at a speed no creature on earth could possibly sustain. The buried weapon swayed with each bound, a mesmerizing and paralyzing dance of death. Somewhere, in the deep recesses of my lizard brain, autonomic cognition kicked in. Because I certainly don't remember getting in my car. I don't remember flying 90 miles an hour down a side street as the monster recklessly pursued me. I don't remember ending up at an abandoned glue factory, the empty cancer cluster one of my clients was having me defend in a class action suit. But I do remember coming too, rocking back and forth, hands on my knees, a slightly high-pitched whine coming from deep inside of me. I do remember eating rat after rat after rat until I was so full, I couldn't move. Four days before my birthday, I smashed my cell phone to bits, drank most of a bottle of whiskey, and ran. Ran and ran. Faster than I remember ever running around the abandoned factory, panicking and shrieking, panicking and shrieking. The rats were gone. Even the insects had fled. 
I just drank and felt an impossibly painful hunger well up inside me. Three days before my birthday, I couldn't bear the hunger anymore and left the factor to find fresh meat. I was halfway through eating a disemboweled cow when it found me. Its howling pierced my brain and echoed throughout my body, a note so high no human could possibly hear it and keep their feet. It sounded like a collection of every creature begging for its life every day on this fetid planet being thrown at me all at once. It chased me, its bone claws screeching and sparking against the gravel of the road, but I miraculously outpaced it, losing it in a forest before making my way back to factory. I didn't realize until I was back in my new little hellhole nest that I had been running on all fours. Two days before the my birthday, it caught me by surprise. I was so consumed with, well, consuming, that I never heard it approach. It slammed its body into me, knocking me from my meal. It whined at me, begged, pleaded, threatened, all at once. I screamed back, nearly matching its pitch. The thing didn't attack me, but it had stolen my meal, was blocking my meal, it took my meal, I wanted my meal, it had my meal, give me my fucking meal. I thrashed and clawed at the beast, feeling my blood boil over with rage. I needed the meat, and it kept defending the lifeless corpses from my snapping jowls. We clawed and scratched and bit and tore into one another almost in unison, synchronized and frenzied. Then I stopped. And so did it. I saw the meal. It was a farmer and his wife. Clients of mine. Oil money. I'd, I'd forgotten their names. I'd forgotten my name. Their faces had been cleanly eaten away. I had eaten the wife's gut. The creature didn't attack me, didn't move, didn't breathe. Just watched me with eyes that weren't. That just weren't. I could almost smell pity coming from it. It began to make an unfamiliar nose. Low, guttural, strained, like it was trying to make a sound it didn't know. I bounded off, lightning in the glowing dark, but I swore I heard it utter a strained no behind me. One day before my birthday, it found me. In my new nest, rotten and rife with bones of every animal imaginable. I woke up to it circling me, slowly, like a carrion bird. This time, I didn't attack. Everything hurt. My bones didn't feel right, like they were being pulled by the invisible hands of evolution. My fingers all felt broken, stretched at the skin. The creature paused and sat on its hind legs. It began its low groan, straining with everything it had. N, 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 O. Know what? I wailed, accusing it, begging it. My words were garbled, half gibberish amidst the shrill screech of my voice, almost unintelligible. P, 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 P. It whipped its head about in frustration, trying to summon some human word that didn't belong to it, wasn't a part of it. P. Happy. My legs gave out and my knees hit the cold factory floor. I wailed. The pain in my bones was unbearable. Happy. My family's nickname for me. The creature trotted slowly, a thousand weapons all clanging together and jostling, buried throughout its body, swaying. That's when it hit me. What was in the eyes that just weren't? Elvin? I whispered, the last time I ever heard my voice in a low tone. G, G, gone. S, 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 it yes. The thing that was once my brother reached its bony hand behind its neck and pulled out the gardening shears. Eyes that just weren't watched me intently as it and began stabbing itself over and over again in the neck. No blood, no spinal fluid, no life force spilled out onto the factory floor. The shears slid in life knife through butter. I felt sick as I looked into the eyes that just weren't. My brother was still somewhere in there. Elvin began pulling each weapon out, one by one, and smashing deep into various parts of its body. Nothing killed it, nothing even made it bleed. Elvin wouldn't die, couldn't. H, H, hungry F forever. S T, starvation W, won't, K kill. C C C C C, erst for, forev, forever. Each word seemed to take everything Elvin had the last bits of humanity draining out of him. He pulled a long knife from the depths of his left shoulder, trotted over, looking at me, into me, with that haunting visage, eyes that just weren't. Elvin gently dropped the blade in my hand, nodding toward my throat. Say. No. The squeal shook the walls of the factory, loose tiles spilling, worn copper pipes plummeting. Hurry. I looked at my watch. It's almost my birthday. I have a choice to make. 